on today's World Inside, as athletes competing at the Beijing Winter Olympics seek to go faster, higher, stronger together, what does the new crop of talent bring to this year's game? And our exclusive exchange with the head of the Norwegian Olympic Committee delegation, the national team with the most medals in Winter Olympics history. 32 medals will be uh, a good uh, achievement for us. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. It's day four of the 2022 Beijing Winter Games, and so far we've seen a lot of bone-chilling competition and history made on the ice. Athletes are certainly giving their all to carry the Olympic spirit. Viewers from all over the world are glued to the winter action. National teams from all corners of the world, big and small, have pitched in to make the games faster, higher, and stronger together. So how to assess the athletes' performances so far? Let's loop in our panelists. For the ongoing Winter Olympics in Lausanne, Dr. Claude Stricker, Executive Director of International Academy of Sports, Science and Technology, and also in Beijing, we have Justin Downs, president of Axis Leisure Management, a winter sports consultant. Welcome to both of you, gentlemen. Thank you. It's a beautiful day in Beijing. The 2022 Winter Olympics are ongoing, and the performances of the sportsmen and women have been tremendous and exhilarating. Tell me more about your assessment so far of their performances. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. We are always very thrilled to see the first days and competition of Olympic Games. And uh, as we all know, it's very special. It's every four years for, for athletes. It's definitely a highlight of their career. Uh, my, my background is in alpine skiing, alpine ski racing. Yes. So I'm really a supporter a fan of the Swiss national ski team. Mm -hmm. So Beat Freud's uh, yesterday with the gold medal was definitely great for, for Switzerland. He's a very appreciated uh, athlete, skier. Uh, he's the fourth to get a gold medal in the Olympic history of alpine ski downhill. Downhill is, as you know, the big uh, events Absolutely. in alpine ski. So mm -hmm. we are very happy. Oh, well, I mean, I'm, I'm an enthusiast when it comes to absolutely everything, but uh, I also am a, a fan of the downhill skiing and alpine. Well, I mean, of course, I, being a Canadian, of course, I was very excited to see uh, our young Canadian team do so well, not only in the downhill yesterday with the fourth place, but also in the Super G today. Um, yeah. For those, if you're in Europe, you might, have, might not have got up early enough to see it, but uh, it just happened a couple of hours ago. Yes. And, uh, Fantastic performance. Uh, unfortunately, Bayat didn't do, do as well today as he did yesterday, but uh, he really is an impressive athlete. And, you know, what, what was really cool about watching yesterday's performance is that it's, it's not only a young person's sport. I mean, the average age of the, of the podium finishers were well into their 30s. A 41-year-old won a silver medal. You know, that's, yeah. uh, that speaks volumes for, for where this sport is. So, you know, we've got people that are 15, 16, yeah. 17 years old competing and people in their mid, mid and late 40s competing. So it's really impressive to see the, the broad range. The inclusiveness mm -hmm. in a way of the Winter Olympics uh, compared to even the Summer Olympics is very impressive. Having said that, though, of course, today, Aling Gu, uh, which, who has become so well known now worldwide for her performance, very young, 18 years old, got her first gold medal by performing something she has never done before, never done before, but she did it on the final competition. Uh, a lot of women power, girl power represented here. But at the same time, you know, looking at all the athletes that are competing, it's so exhilarating over the past few days already. Oh, well, I mean, look, they, these, these athletes have been training their entire lives for, the, for this one moment. And you of talk course. about uh, Eileen Gu's performance. She, she had to do something she'd never done before to beat her rivals. And, uh, and, and thankfully for her, she, she nailed it and she did a fantastic performance. But these guys really have to, guys and girls really have to push themselves. They have a one shot, you know, maybe it's one shot in their entire career. Maybe in the case of Eileen, she has many more years to come. 
But, you know, they have been training and visualizing this opportunity. And for the Chinese athletes to do it on home soil in, in front of, uh, you know, an adoring massive population um, is, is really a, a, an experience of a lifetime for them. So, but what was really nice to see at the end of that, uh, that big air competition was just the emotion that all of the competitor, competitors, when they come together, yes, they're, they're fierce competitors one-on-one, -on -one, but at the end of the day, they're a family and a fraternity. And it was really good to see the winner, the winners console the others and the teams, the, the various athletes just come together and enjoy that experience because it is once in a lifetime for them. You can feel the bound in the air in a way because uh, all these athletes have to overcome tremendous challenges compared maybe to their peers throughout generation because of the ongoing pandemic worldwide. Uh, there are a lot of uncertainties. Uh, maybe they didn't even know what's next before they came to the 2022 Winter Olympics Games. And even during the trip, there are a lot of uncertainties. So uh, that takes a lot of energy. But it seems that the sportsmen and women, they are handling this with gracefulness. Yeah, uh, for, for sure. I mean, mm. look, the, the, the situations uh, could be more ideal. Uh, but at the end of the day, what, what the, the organizing committee here and the various, uh, various organizers from, from the, their own federations to the IOC have done is they've really tried to take away a lot of the distractions. So, yes, it, it might be inconvenient to do constant uh, COVID testing or these types of things. But they have done their very best to make sure that the athletes are comfortable, that they're enjoying themselves, that the accommodations are good, the meals are good. Mm. And first and foremost, that the venues are world class. Mm. And I think you've heard every comment from whether it be ice to snow to freestyle. Uh, everybody is unbelievably impressed about what has been created here from a venue standpoint. Mm. So really, mm -hmm. they've taken away as many of the variables as possible. In fact, they probably have less to worry about than they normally would and can just focus on their performance. What do you and that's mean by that? Well, I mean, look, there are, you know, typically there might be distractions with a lot of media or distractions with hospitality or, or uh, crowd, you know, crowds or, you know, sometimes crowds are good, sometimes they're bad for, yeah. for an athlete. It depends on their point of view. But really what they're doing is they're focusing on their own athletic performance. They're in the zone, as we would say. So I think in some ways it might, might have simplified things for them to focus. How do you see new technologies and new scientific uh, improvement are being applied for the preparations of the games and also uh, that are, you know, part of the service uh, to the athletes? Mm -hmm. I think now with um, digital um, progress and all the technology related to digital, definitely more and more support from, uh, you know, data scientists, uh, data analytics, um, probably an evolution more and more toward neural, with neuroscience as well. Mm -hmm. So a lot of, uh, I would say, science now in the training, yeah. especially in uh, this sport where motor skill is so important, gravity sports. Uh, so I would say more and more sophistication from science, definitely. But probably next, uh, I would say next uh, evolution is certainly related to neuroscience, so to know more the, you know, the, the, the link between the brain, plasticity of the brain, and uh, motor skill acquisition, as well as uh, all the rest. Of tell the tell me, how, how is that likely to be applied? Uh, give me a, a category or a, a sport. Uh, how athletes mm. could prepare with that? Well, if I take an example of evolution with alpine skiing, where definitely the strengths of the legs are so important because you have G's right in the curve. Uh, so you have those athletes with incredible uh, legs and strengths now with the, the ski technology evolution and the techniques push so hard. It's no more to have the most strengths, but to find a better coordination and control of the movement at a certain, uh, certain force. So you don't train anymore by pushing so hard that you, you, know, you can lift the most weight you can, mm -hmm. but you really train at very uh, sensitive uh, zone where you get the most control of the system, ski bindings, and your corporate mm. body. So the precision, 
and the power yes. as a result of a technological application is going to be tremendous. It's already shown here at the 2022 Beijing Olympics, by the way, already among many athletes. Uh, Mr. Downs, Another thing, it's about mental health of the athletes. I mean, you are doing the, the, the consultations for many of the teams and also for the organizers. How to prepare and how during the process of the games be able to support the athletes? You know, I can't speak for every nation, but coming from the Canadian side, you know, our, our na in, in our national system as well as within the federations have very strong support systems for our athletes. And yes, they look like they're at the pinnacle of their career. Nothing could be better for them. Uh, they're, they're, they're young, they're attractive, they're strong, they have a long career ahead of them. But they are uh, very nervous and unstable about how things will progress. Just getting to Beijing was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences probably any of them have ever had to go through. They haven't been able to train. They haven't been able to compete. They didn't know if they would make the team. They didn't know if they would get COVID before they left or when they got here. They had no idea. It was just so uncertain for them. You know, at least in the Canadian system, I know we have a strong uh, background of psychotherapists and, yeah. and support systems within the teams, but then also external to the teams to give the athletes a chance to release their stress. Um, so we can never underestimate what goes on behind people's eyes when they're getting prepared for these things. Right. And Mr. Down, particularly with the Omicron, which is spreading so fast, uh, in different populations around the world, uh, athletes sometimes they have to remain a little bit separated from the crowds, including from their teammates. No, so it was really about creating like a system like this, is Zoom, Zoom families where people could, uh, you know, joke and enjoy and just kind of let let off steam, right? Yeah. So, you know, that it is unbelievably close. In some of these countries, for example, I mean, Canada's got a huge team, as does Switzerland, but some of these teams are very, very small to start with. So you go from like a team of two or three down to I'm by myself with the weight of the world on my shoulders. Not only have the teams come together with the, within themselves, but I think they've also come together internationally as well. So yeah. other teams supporting each other. So it is just one big family at the end mm. of the day, even though we're competing for the same for the same prize. Uh, Dr. Stricker, I really wonder, you know, how the world should be and could be inspired by these athletes and their performances. You know, they, 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 they demonstrate that with hard work, uh, sticking with the objective, they can perform. Uh, but in the same time, and you can, you know, hear from many of those athletes that they, they, they keep the pleasure. They keep the, the pleasure of doing their sport. It's really part of the success. It's not just the iron wheel to win, but also having, you know, experiencing having this pleasure and uh, again as we said uh, being within a team even if it's indiv individual sport for for the non-collective sport non-team sport yeah and that's what is inspiring basically uh, they, they can find and and and, and uh, basically find the flow by having on one side still this pleasure to um, you know, master the movements, uh, experience the snow uh, together with a uh, you know, very clear objective. Uh, Mr. Downs, looking at some of the delegations, you know, some are just uh, two or three persons total. Uh, and, and many of those athletes are coming from countries where there's no snow, there's no ice naturally you know, in their environment you know, the resilience that they show and the love they show for the winter sports really gives us a lot of uh, a very different taste of what Winter Olympic Games are about. You know, you can, it goes back to, I forget which Olympics was, but the Jamaican bobsled team. I mean, this yeah. is now, it's one of the best stories of, uh, of Olympic Games history or Eddie the Eagle or, you know, now we've got Tong Tongan athletes and Sa Saudi Arabian athletes. You know, it's, it's really fantastic. And Technology, yes, money, money can get you to do whatever you want. And certainly a lot of these governments don't necessarily support their athletes. They need to be self-funded. Um, but it really shows that if you put your heart and your soul into something, and if you have a vision, you can achieve it. And that's where I think the Olympics, it's not just about who has the most money or the biggest support network. It's all about individual performance at the end of the day. And uh, there's no, there's no, no boundaries and no restrictions. Right? Whether you're young or old, male, female, does, doesn't matter. Uh, you can achieve anything you like.
And also thank you, the two of you, for uh, your service uh, to the athletes and also to the delegations and the games. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Downs and Dr. Stricker. Really appreciate it. And this is World Insight. Coming up, our exclusive exchange with the head of the Norwegian Olympic Committee delegation, the national team with the most medals in Winter Olympic history. How did Norway do it? And what's the inspiration for all the others? Stay with us. In 1924, a winter multi-sport event was held in the French commune of Chamonix. The resort area at the foot of Mont Blanc became the birthplace of the quadrennial Winter Olympics. Team China first competed at the 1980 Lake Placid Winter Games with 28 athletes and 18 events. There and then, China made her significant debut in the history of the Winter Olympics. Twelve years of persistence won China a first Winter Olympics medal, with Ye Chao Bo awarded a silver in 1992. A decade later, Yang Yang created history by winning China's first winter gold. From the Summer Games in 2008 to the Winter Games in 2022, Beijing is the world's first dual Olympic city. And this is just the beginning. with me, Tian Wei. Norwegian cross-country skier Teresa Hoge won the first gold medal at the 2022 Winter Olympic Games. Norway is the most successful country in Winter Olympic history, leading the all-time gold medal tally. In recent years, the country has struck a deal with China to send Chinese athletes to famed Norwegian boards for training. So what's the secret behind Norway's Winter Olympic success? How can China and Norway's training program bearing fruit? Earlier, I talked to Tal Avlebe, the head of Norway's Olympic Committee delegation. Let's listen to his assessment. Tula Avlebe, Chief of Mission of Norway. Thank you so much for joining us, Tula. Thank you for asking me. I know you've been running around between the venue and also your hotel. Uh, I'm, let me ask you about this. As chief of mission of Norway this time, what is your hope for Team Norway? Uh, yeah, we have several uh, uh, types of hopes. Um, we hope, of course, that uh, we will uh, experience a lot of sport as a joy of sport. That's the most important all the time. So. We have one. Uh, we have different type of goals, and one of the goal is that we should be at least as good friends when we leave China as when we came here. <laughs> so the team spirit is very important. Mm -hmm. But we also have a medal target that we have discussed with the uh, sport managers and so on, and that's uh, 32 medals. That's the overall target. Mm -hmm. But if you some the expectation of one and each uh, athlete, it will be much higher. But our experience is that we should have some uh, think, uh, we should live by the heart, but we should use the head uh, for thinking. So we find out that 32 medals will be uh, a good uh, achievement for us. All the best for that goal, by the way, and also our best wishes uh, to the team Norwegian. Uh, let me ask you, you got Team Norway the first gold medal for 2022 Winter Olympics. And in history, Norway is the owner, the biggest owner of gold medals of Winter Olympics ever. Tell me more about these gold medals, particularly the very first one for this year. Yeah, that was Teresa Juha who won the first one in uh, duathlon for uh, cross-country skiing. That's her first individual medal. She has uh, a couple from earlier on as a part of a team, but this was her first and she was very, very happy. 
And it was also a tough one because the conditions up here at 1,700 meters above sea level and very cold and dry snow. So it was really an achievement and we were very happy. And we had a big celebration in the Olympic Village where we ate muffins. <laughs> so we were... <laughs> That's a lot of energy, right? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> uh, you know, there were so many friends uh, cheering for her, uh, ch Chinese included, as you may know. Uh, so what do you make of, uh, you know, the challenges of this year? I mean, everybody is experiencing the challenging years over the past few years uh, with the COVID-19. For the athletes coming from all over the world, including from China and Norway, also particularly true. How are you overcoming all these challenges? Um, it has been, uh, as you say, a challenge and it has been ongoing. So it has been quite tough and it has created quite a bit of anxiousness because the, the number of uh, positive uh, uh, COVID uh, people in Europe has, and especially in Norway, has raised a lot the last couple of weeks. Mm. So uh, it uh, became a very tense situation the last the couple of weeks before we, we left Norway. Mm. The biggest challenge though has been to keep a focus for development of the sport and not only, uh, only focus to cope with uh, different kind of restrictions uh, connected to the COVID situation. Many have noticed uh, the enthusiasm uh, for winter sports in China. Norway has been playing a very key role in supporting uh, many athletes from China to train your country, for example, and to share experiences with uh, uh, Chinese athletes and coaches. Tell me more about that uh, through, through years and, and decades. Yeah, we, um, we also have uh, quite a few uh, Norwegian coaches that are coaches for the, the Chinese athletes. There used to be ski jumpers a couple of years ago, and there's been a lot of cross country. And also uh, biathlon has been a, a close cooperation. And the teams, uh, the Norwegian team, find this uh, very useful. And I hope that the Chinese uh, counterpart also feel that this is, uh, this is of value. Um, so we see what will happen after these Olympics. I know that China is uh, quite uh, able to manage these things on your own when you really know the, when you have the knowledge that's necessary. And I also noticed that the number of interested athletes and youngsters doing winter sports, ice and snow sports has raised quite a lot. And Absolutely. also like the result in slope style today with silver for China, I think that will encourage a lot of the young uh, Chinese to try out uh, uh, the snowboard and the free skiing events. Mm. Tola, a lot of Chinese are very appreciative of what Norway has been doing in supporting many Chinese athletes and coaches uh, and also to share your experiences uh, with the Chinese on the winter sport. After all, you are the giant with only a few million people, the population. You managed to get the largest number of gold medals ever in Olympic history. I mean, Winter Olympics. Many ask, is there some quote unquote, the secret remedies behind? Uh, this, <laughs> the secret is, uh, is um, you could say it's hard work and that's why it, uh, it's kept as a secret because nobody <laughs> wants to do the necessary work to really, to really allow. Quite a few people will do the necessary work mm. to really uh, reach the, the summit of the sports. But uh, the truth is that we have uh, a good, very good welfare system in Norway. So very, and we have uh, lots of clubs that's doing uh, voluntary work. Uh, so it's quite uh, easy to uh, get involved in sport as a kid mm. in Norway, and it's quite common. Actually, at the age of 25, 93% of the youngsters of Norway has been involved in organized sports. Wow. That means that nearly all of the population is a talent pool that and that gives us a good opportunity and if we manage to make this interesting and uh, uh, and give them a good feeling the youngsters then some of them really develops ambitions and really want to find out how good they can be at international level yeah. and that i think that is the secret That's and it's amazing. very very much 
inner motivated. It's <laughs> the motivated. athlete that wants to win yeah. and we are supporting them. Uh, having said that though, have you noticed the enthusiasm from the Chinese about winter sports? Either as spectators, as practitioners, or as just amateurs like me? <laughs> yeah, I have, I have not been to China for quite a few years now because of the restrictions, so I have not been able to see the the development of the number of uh, of uh, eager Chinese, but I've seen that that uh, this area that we are visiting now up in Sangsiaku, mm -hmm. uh, we see that the Tai Wu Resort and the Genting Resort has developed tremendously the last three or four years. We have a great capacity to uh, to uh, make it possible for uh, sport and ice enthusiasts to really use the ice and the snow, mm -hmm. and also the infrastructure. Uh, with transportation and uh, the possibility to, to move from Beijing and up in the snow has developed a lot uh, only in the, f uh, the last few years. So the, it really should be possible to, to even develop more of this enthusiasm for the mm. winter and the snow and the ice. You know, the music coming from Norway, we know it is the birthplace of heavy metal music, especially some of the most important branches like, uh, uh, like the... Uh, a black metal and also, you know, the Gothic metal, the Viking metal. How is music playing its role with sport in a way? Uh, we are actually working with one of the key figures in the in the black metal movement, Sati from Satyricon. He's a friend of mine, and we we are uh, developing ideas for developing athletes and artists. So we really consider these uh, black metal people as artists. Uh -huh. They have chosen their way of expressing themselves that is quite uh, connected to the Viking blood, probably, because it's very <laughs> seemingly aggressive and full of energy. Yeah. But when you meet these uh, guys uh, outside the stage, they are very, very friendly and polite mm -hmm. people. So they are more artists than, than Vikings, because I don't think the Vikings were that polite outside the... <laughs> 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 Many Chinese young people conquering. also know those uh, heavy metal, uh, you know, uh, music branches. Actually, they enjoyed it as well in the music uh, festivals around China. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. I want to thank you so much, Atola of Le Beau, uh, for your time and also uh, running to uh, our our video interview out of very busy schedule. All the best to Team Norway and also the friendship on ice and snow between China and Norway. Thank you very much. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more Search World Insights, check out our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for being with us. Bye for now.